Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, we have been discussing about controller design for quite some time. We talked about how to design PID controllers. Well, we didn't really talk about PID controllers, but we talked a little bit about the fact that PID controllers are typically used in a lot of different types of control systems. And, <coughs> and the tuning of PID controllers is something that I'm assuming you would have taken a class. It's not a prerequisite for this class, but since you are interested in this class, you might have taken a control systems class before and you might be aware of how PID controllers are tuned. So starting from PID controllers, we talked about how to design feedback controller when you have an optimization objective in mind, when you want to optimize something, and that something could be some resource that you are trying to minimize, like electricity or energy consumption or emissions, or it could be something that you are trying to maximize, which could be profit or which could be some other quantity of interest, maximizing comfort, maximizing profit. Those are the things that you would typically want to maximize. And based on all this information that we have, uh, uh, so then, then we said, okay, fine. And now that I have a dynamic system, I could use dynamic programming to compute the optimal strategy. And then we said, look, I have a lot of experience. I've been doing this for 15 years. I have a lot of experience. I kind of, sort of know what the optimal strategy looks like. So how do you incorporate that knowledge? And so we talked about nominal trajectory and trying to minimize the error with respect to the nominal trajectory. And we posed it as a linear quadratic uh, controller, re linear quadratic regulator problem, where we want to regulate the error to zero but we don't want to invest too much effort in trying to regulate the error to zero. So we want to have a trade-off between trying to force the error to zero and using a lot of effort in order to do that. Right? So Q and R matrices were allowing you to make that trade-off, come up with the right trade-off between forcing the error to zero and letting the effort uh, be as small as possible to achieve that objective. Now, today, I want to generalize this whole concept, uh, not generalize, but I want to tell you about MPC, uh, Model Predictive Control, which is a very widely used dynamic programming algorithm in a large number of feedback control systems like vehicles or chemical plants, at least those that are advanced. Those that are still sort of lagging behind, industries that are lagging behind, they would be using PID controllers but industries that are advancing, like automotive industry, uh, they are moving from PID controller-based design to uh, optimization and MPC-based design. So that's why I want to cover MPC, model predictive control. So that's the first topic for today. It's not going to take too much time, MPC in short. So this is not going to take too much time. Uh, so we'll talk about model predictive control. And, and then I'm going to talk about time scale separation. So this was a question that somebody asked, I think you asked in the class a few days, few days back, which is how do you, what happens in a system where some process are, processes are getting controlled at a second scale and the other processes are being controlled at millisecond scale? How do you design controllers for those kind of processes? So we'll talk about singular perturbation theory and a way to design controllers for singularly perturbed systems. So we'll talk about that in the second half of the class. And then the portion on controller design will be over, and we'll move on to statistics and hypothesis testing next week onwards. So let's think about what model predictive control does. So remember, we were talking about this error as a state and the deviation from nominal action as your new action that you wanted to optimize in the previous class. So model predictive control says, let's forget about error and all that stuff. This is what we want to do. I have a system which I can write. It's a nonlinear system. Pretty much most systems you will encounter in real life would be nonlinear system. 
You can always linearize it around the nominal trajectory as we had done in the previous class. So it's a nonlinear system. And my goal, minimize cost to such that x capital T plus 1 is equal to 0. So instead of calling it error, now we have just renamed the state. And the state is somehow, you can construe the state as an error, not really the state. So it's not really the temperature of this room that is the state, but the temperature minus the set point, which right now it's 70.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit. That, no, 70.7 .7 is the current temperature, and the set point is 71.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So this xt, the state, now is the difference between these two quantities. So for this room, the difference is 0 0.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And we want to minimize the cost so that after one hour, after one hour, after 60 minutes, 60 time steps, that error is zero, okay? That's our control problem now. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we'll just formulate it as a mathematical, like as a dynamic optimization problem and then use dynamic programming to solve it. So typically the cost here would be I want to minimize overall policies, gamma t uh, that maps xt to ut, so maps state to action, maps deviation to what action I should take. And of course, you have the constraint I have added this additional constraint here, x capital T equal, oh, x capital T plus 1 is equal to 0. The terminal cost is, is within the summation, right? Uh, well, it's outside the summation, actually. Outside. Yeah, it's the it's outside the summation. So you will have one of these two one of these two constraints, either x t plus one equals to zero, sorry, x t plus one equals to zero, or you will have a terminal cost for the state. I have absorbed the noise term W t. I have absorbed it in F t and H definition of F t, H t, and G t. All of the noises are absorbed in these expressions. I'm not writing it explicitly here. I just want to ask. Yes. Uh, how will this implement this algorithm? Uh, suppose, let's say, I want to implement it with this uh, thermostat. Thermostat. So yeah. How are we going to do that here? Uh, what will be the. Right. Uh, how will we form the mean? This is an. Right, right. So the question is, uh, if we want to implement this algorithm on this thermostat, how do we do that? And well, in order to do that, you first have to get enough data to identify what this FT looks like. In our case, in the case, in this particular problem, this HT and GT would be some air conditioning constraint, like uh, can you turn it on and off very frequently, or do you need to turn on the air conditioning system and keep it on for a certain amount of time. So for instance, for residential HVAC system, once you turn it on, it is best practice to keep it on for at least five to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. You don't want to turn it off in two minutes and then turn it on after two minutes and then turn it off in two minutes and then turn it on after two minutes. That's called short cycling and it will fatigue the air conditioning system and you will have very early failure. So sometimes you add those constraints here and say that, okay, the air conditioning system must run for five minutes and only then you can turn it off. Otherwise, don't turn it on. So you will, you will 
add more states in the system to keep track of how long the air conditioning system has run. And then you will add the constraint that if xt is greater than 5, ut can be 0 or 1. But if xt is less than 5, then ut must be the same as what it was earlier, right? So ut must be equal to ut minus 1. So, <clears throat> so you can add all those constraints here. And the Q and R matrix is something that we need to decide. Like, it's not something that's given. So we could keep Q to be 0 0.1 and R to be 1. And we can run the optimization. We can, uh, uh, we can have some implementation and demonstration and see whether we are feeling comfortable or not. If you're not feeling comfortable, then change the value of Q, change the value of R, and then redo the optimization. Uh, so Q and R, so uh, these are one-dimensional. Like In this case, yes, it's one-dimensional, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so we are sitting in this room, so you are thinking of it as a one-dimensional problem, but the entire building has maybe like 50 classrooms or 50 rooms with thermostats. So it's actually a 50-dimensional problem. And you have like one or maybe two air conditioning systems for the entire building. Like it's a very large air conditioning system. So, so it's, yeah, you might think of it as one-dimensional problem, but in reality, it's a 50-dimensional problem for this building. And then you have uh, maybe like... A, 100 such buildings on the campus. So if you want to do campus-wide optimization, it's a 5,000-dimensional optimization problem, right? So it's, it's a... For all of the uh, like 5,000, let's say, we have 1,000 dimensions. So right. how will we decide the R for that? So that's where, that's where you have to do some trial and error. It's not something that, that you know, somebody will tell you. Okay. you. You have to do trial and error, and first of all, Remember in the first class we talked about this V-shaped diagram. So you do like, uh, you identify what the threat model is. You identify the system model, then threat model, and then you design strategy. Then you do software in the loop simulation, then hardware in the loop simulation, then actual implementation and fine tuning. And then you deploy it in real world system. So we are still like talking about the system modeling and the solution approaches. And then you will do software in the loop simulation, then you will do hardware in the loop simulation, then you will do uh, demonstration on one building and if it looks good on one building everybody is happy everybody is comfortable then you deploy it over a large number of buildings right so so it, it's it's a complicated problem it's not that simple uh, but at least it uh, you know given that the emission standards are tightening if you want to minimize the fuel consumption if you want to have better battery pack optimization in vehicles or if you want to have better uh, thermal control of a building in order to minimize emissions or minimize uh, energy consumption, you have to get to this level. You can't just use PID controllers and expect it to do well. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Any other question? No? Okay. So this is the problem that, need, that needs to be solved. In M so this is the usual MPC problem. Um, Instead of talking about error and all that stuff, everything is written in terms of state, everything is written in terms of action. And uh, you, have the, you have ways to trade off the Q and R. The optimal control action here is no longer linear, just like gamma star will not be KT times XT. And the reason is uh, this system is nonlinear, so FT is nonlinear, even though the cost function is quadratic, so the cost function looks convex. But because FT is nonlinear, this whole optimization problem becomes nonlinear. So, so you have to come up with methods to solve this optimization problem, which we are not going to talk about in this class, but know that there are millions of packages which can solve these optimizations, well, not millions, but sufficiently large number of packages which can solve this optimization problem, either in real time or near real time. And if and if you go to a forward-looking industry, so what's a forward? So if you don't go to an oil rig, oil rig is a very, very uh, traditional industry. It's been around for like hundreds of years. So they are not going to be implementing all these sophisticated controllers on oil rigs, because if this thing fails, they will lose a million dollar plus per day. So they won't be applying all this fancy controller. They may not be, like I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that industry. But I just don't see many papers written on that particular topic, on how to do optimization for oil rigs. On the other hand, if you go to vehicle industry, it's quite likely that 
uh, you will be writing this code in your first year as a, as a software engineer in that company. Because almost every system within the vehicle is moving from traditional PID control to MPC-based control design. So you will have like small microprocessors or FPGAs, and you will have to implement the algorithm for solving this problem on those FPGAs. That's what your job is going to be for the next two, three years if you go to those forward-looking industries. OK. Now, the only thing that is uh, important here to know is in some, some uh, problems, you would prefer to have a terminal cost for the state. So if the state is too high, you want to add a very high cost to it. Uh, in other cases, you just want to have the constraint that xt plus 1 should be equal to 0, which means that the terminal state must be 0, or terminal error in, in the case of this thermostat control must be 0. Okay, in that case, you don't have to put this terminal cost. So depending on the problem, depending on the situation, you might have a terminal cost or you might have a terminal constraint, a terminal state constraint. And then there are multiple variations of this MPC problem that we will not talk about, but they are there. Like there are books written on this topic. Uh, so there are multiple flavors of this particular optimization problem. Now, how do you solve this problem? So if, if it is this problem, we have, I have already given you the dynamic programming decomposition right in one of the previous classes, so you can solve it easily using dynamic programming. On the other hand, if you have a problem where x capital T plus 1 must be equal to 0, if this is the problem that you want to solve, then the way to solve it is in the dynamic programming case, you define your Vt of xt as xt ut equals to 0. Uh, xt ut less than equal to 0. This is the xt plus 1. You just have one more equality constraint to take care of. So these two become equality. I mean, you have to consider both the equality constraints now instead of a terminal cost. And then rest of the step is going to be the same. There's no difference. You just have to augment the terminal, uh, one more equality constraint in the terminal optimization problem for value function. OK, any question? Yes, please. So the terminal cost term here, uh, we brought it because we incorporated. Because, yeah, you just want xt plus 1 to be 0. So if you have, so suppose you have plus ct plus 1, xt plus 1, but because you want xt plus 1 equal to 0, this is just ct plus 1, 0. So it doesn't really matter if you consider terminal cost or not in that case, when you have an equality constraint. Now you could argue that I want my xt plus 1 to be in some terminal set. Then, then it creates a problem. Then you have to be a bit more careful. So, so yeah, those are different flavors of the problem that I'm not talking about in the class. So the different flavors of the problems are as follows. You want your xt plus 1 to be in some set. So you want your terminal state to be in certain set. Uh, that is typically the case when you are, let's say, doing autonomous driving. And you want, well, in that case, there are a little bit more constraints. So you, you have like a safe set. If you want to do a lane change maneuver, you have a safe set of trajectories. 
and you want your entire trajectory to be within that safe set of trajectories. You don't want it to have collision in the middle of a trajectory. So in those cases, you have like a tube constraint on the state, uh, where the state has to be in between some variable, some value, because you want to maintain safe distance with the vehicle in front, safe distance with the vehicles on the side. You want to be, you don't want to be driving in the uh, in the lane divider, on the lane divider. So you don't want to be driving like you are not neither in this lane nor in that lane, and you are like you're driving on the lane divider. So because of all those constraints, you typically have what is known as a tube constraint, and you want your entire trajectory be, to be in the tube. Uh, you have robust MPC. So in the robust MPC, you have some noises, and you put a max over all possible noises. So no matter how bad the noise is, you're still able to control optimally. So that's robust MPC. So that becomes a min-max problem, which is a whole new uh, complication. So we don't want to talk about that in this class. So why would you maximize the error? Not the error. You are maximizing over all noises. So no matter how bad the noise is, you are still able to optimize the system. OK? So, so consider the following situation. You are, uh, there is a car, a drunk driver, on the road. And you are driving. Your autonomous car is driving next to a drunk driver, right? So no matter what the drunk driver does, you still want to be safe. Right? Or, or there is a pedestrian, or there is a kid on the road. No matter what the kid does, you still want to be safe. Like You want to be safe, and the, you want the kid to be safe. So those are the cases where you do maximization over noise, minimization over action, or minimization over policies. If you are in an oil rig, uh, you know when you are drilling oil, you can hit different types of rocks okay, in, the, in the seabed. And uh, you kind of have an idea based on your experience what kind of rocks you are going to expect in this particular area. And so you want your optimization to be robust to any kind of rock that you might see while you are drilling for oil. right? So, so all those cases, you want to be very careful about the worst case situation. So here we are just careful. There is no worst case. right? There is no notion of noise in this problem. But there are situations where there are noises, and you want to be robust to all possible forms of noises, not just the average noise, so to say. In the HVAC control, I don't care. Like, yeah, the temperature of the, like, I have a prediction that in the night today, the temperature is going to be 65 degrees Fahrenheit. But uh, if it is 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 64 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't, it's, it's not going to make any big difference. So I don't care about the maximization. But example of the petroleum industry. Right. So if we want to decide, let's say for drilling the right. drill machine, uh, we want some terminal cost too. They probably will have some terminal cost, yes. That, that will have some terminal cost, right? It may. I mean, depending on what they want, what their objective is, whether there is some error that they want to minimize or whether it's uh, some terminal, like they want the state to be in some set. I don't know what kind of problems they are facing, but different problems will have different formulations. Okay. Yeah. So we can't just always uh, set this xt plus 1 is equal to 0. Like we can't generalize for most of the machines, right? Right. So it depends. This is just one type of formulation. There are like um, 200 other types of MPCs that people can come up with in different industries. This is, one, this is the one that is uh, most widely studied, MPC, because it's sort of simple. It has a simple way to solve. But I just want you to know that more complicated versions of MPC exist. This is not the ultimate theory you know, for, to design controllers for feedback systems. Any other question? OK. So this is the MPC, model predictive control, where you have a model of the plant, and you have the cost function. You have constraints you want to minimize. Come up with a controller control policy, execute that control policy, and move forward in life. So that's MPC. Now let's talk about situations where there is time scale separation. Uh, 
So I'm a driver, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the road, I'm looking at the road, I'm looking at the traffic light, and I'm deciding what I need to do in the next five seconds, in the next 10 seconds, okay? So that's what my goal as a driver is. However, as a driver, I see everything, I figure out what the optimal strategy, what the optimal policy for me is, how should I be driving, how should I be accelerating, decelerating, braking, and all that stuff. And I, I, I press the accelerator, I press the brake, and then the vehicle has to figure out, okay, I have to minimize the emissions, I have to make sure that my battery is doing well, I shouldn't uh, put too much current in the battery because that will screw up the chemistry of the battery. So, so, so the engine also has to do some optimization. I'm doing optimization at a higher level. I'm making sure that my car is safe. But at the engine level, they are making, the engine has to make sure that there is not too much emission. Uh, we shouldn't have carbon suit coming out. We, should, uh, have, uh, we, we shouldn't be putting too much current in the battery and things like that. So engine also has a whole bunch of uh, objectives to meet. Uh, many of those objectives are actually regulations. So, so the regulatory body decides this is what you are supposed to do. Like y your emission has to be under this, this uh, constraint. And so they have to follow it. Like there's nothing much they can do about it. So now I have two systems. One is myself thinking at second scale and one is the engine which is running at 3000 RPM or, or 2500 RPM. Uh, and it is thinking in millisecond scale, okay? Or, or hundreds of millisecond scale. So there is a time scale separation, and the question is how do we determine a feedback control strategy in this setting? And if you think about it, most of the complex systems will have this time scale separation. There's something happening at seconds or hour scale, uh, and that's sending commands to a lower level subsystem where things are happening at minutes or second scale, and that system is deciding something and sending commands to even further lower level subsystems uh, which are running at milliseconds or microsecond scale. So this happens in, in, in a large number of systems. And so what we are going to discuss is how do you design control strategies in those systems. Let me give you a non-traditional example of this idea. So consider Uber and Lyft, okay? We don't really consider them as dynamic systems, but they are actually dynamic systems. And so they have to figure out how to incentivize drivers to send at different spots in the city. Uh, and they have to do that at the hour scale because the demand for travel changes at the hour scale. Now, the drivers, they go to appropriate location, they pick up passengers, and then they start driving and when they are driving, they want to be, of course, uh, in the safe zone at all points of time. And they are executing the commands at second scale. So Lyft is doing the optimization for hour scale. The drivers are doing the optimization for, for second scale. And then, of course, the engine in the car is taking actions at a millisecond scale. So as you can see, it's a non-traditional example, but it is a situation where things are, there is a time scale separation in different layers of optimization. So here is a way to think about it. This is a conceptual formulation of that problem. Let me call this singular, part. it's called singular perturbation theory. And here the, the problem is as follows. xt, yt, ut. I'm just assuming a single control action, but you could have two different u1t and u2t for two different time scales. So this is the slow dynamics. And this is the fast dynamic. And since this is an ECE class, epsilon is always a small number. Uh, 
it's a small number. In this case, yes, it can be negative. But it doesn't matter. You can just multiply F1 to negative F1, right? And you can keep epsilon to be positive. It doesn't really matter. But just assume, for the sake of this particular lecture, that epsilon can take positive or negative values. But it's close to 0. So epsilon could be minus 0 0.1 or plus 0 0.1. But it can't be like uh, 5 or minus 5. OK? It's a small number. What do you notice in this dynamics? What's the cool feature of this dynamics? What happens in one time step? What happens in one time step here? What happens if epsilon is equal to 0? Right, so xt will always be x0 all the time. So what happens when epsilon is a small number? So will it be close to x0 or will it be far away from x0? But that too will depend on the function. Right, so I'm assuming that epsilon is a small number. And so the function is of the same order as x. So epsilon is 0 0.1. And let's say the output of f is going to be like 45 miles an hour. Okay. Or maybe not 0 0.1. Let's, for this particular example, let's make it 0 0.01. Right. Uh, is some small value, it will be uh, significant for the small, small dynamic system. Right. So basically, so think about it this way. Let's, for the sake of argument, F1's output is between 0 to 10. Epsilon is equal to 10 raised to minus 4. And capital T, which is the horizon length, is of the order of uh, 50. OK? So if you think about this example, where you look at the output of F1, you look at the value of epsilon, and you look at the time horizon that you're looking at, you would agree that xt seems to be close to x0. OK? It doesn't really deviate too much from x0. So when I'm driving the vehicle, and I'm just coasting, OK? I'm just uh, changing my pedal and brake a little bit, just to make sure that I'm within the safe boundary. I'm, it's a free-flowing traffic on the, on the road, on the highway. And there are no stop signs, there are no traffic lights, and I'm just driving my vehicle. That's what the situation is. My speed will change over time. So over the 5 seconds interval or 10 seconds interval, my speed can go from 65 to 68 miles per hour, or it can go down to 62 miles per hour. But it's going to remain within 65 miles per hour range. And so in this case, in the slow dynamics, what you notice is that xt is going to be close to x0 for most of the time. In the fast dynamics, things change quite rapidly. Okay? So things are, things are happening at a much faster time scale. And so the question is, suppose we have a system like this. right? So yt is what the engine is doing, xt is what the driver is doing. I have a system like this. How do I design the control strategy? So here the state is xt and yt. Action is ut. And I want to design a control strategy gamma t that maps xt, gamma star t, that maps xt to, sorry, xt yt. To ut. That's what I want to do. I want to come up with this uh, optimal strategy. And I have some cost function. Uh, let me 
write down the cost function I want to minimize summation of CT, XT, YT, UT such that G capital T, XT, YT, UT is less than equal to 0. So that is my objective function that I want to minimize. You can put equality constraints. You can make this problem as complicated as you want. But let's, for the sake of argument, we want to keep it simple. How would you, what do you think, how would you proceed? What would, the, what would a cool solution for this problem look like? Let's say you want to drive your vehicle and you want to minimize emissions. That's your goal. You want to be energy efficient. And you understand about this, this separation of time scale, where you are thinking at a, higher time, at a slower time scale and the engine is reacting at a much faster time scale. What would a cool solution for this problem look like? What do you think? So what was the question? So the question is, how would you solve this problem? Okay, so you have this uh, time scale separation. And uh, consider a concrete example. So you want to come up with a strategy which is fuel efficient for an autonomous vehicle. Uh, and you understand this time scale separation where the planning happens at a slower time scale, but the execution happens at a much faster time scale. Right? So this is the planning problem and the execution problem. And you have some objective function. So the government has mandated that all autonomous cars must have emissions less than equal to blah. So that's, that's your objective function. You want to minimize emissions. How would you think about solving this problem? A hacky way, whatever hacky way you can come up with. What would be a hacky way of solving this problem? Yeah, these are the government uh, like mandates. Right. That you have that's right. So you have the state dynamics figured out. So planning problem figured out. You have the execution uh, problem figured out, not problem, but like the state dynamics. And this is what the mandate, the government's mandate is. So you want to have a safe driving strategy, but you want to minimize emissions. Okay. Probably hard code uh, controlling the states with, with whatever minimum value that I come up with from solving this problem. Right, but this problem is going to change throughout the lifetime of the vehicle, right? So summer problem will be different, snowy weather problem will be different, rainy weather problem will be different, stormy problem would be different. So it's, it's like a whole bunch of problems that you need to solve at different stages. So <coughs> you are right that you can put everything in the state, run a supercomputer, come up with the optimal policy, and deploy it on all the vehicles. But uh, the problem is that over long periods of time, you would want to update it. So that doesn't look like a reasonable problem to solve. So typically what you do is, instead of worrying about running the whole thing on a supercomputer and dumping the solution on a vehicle, what people typically do is they try to compute the solution on the fly, because then a lot of things are already determined. The road traction is determined, the weather is determined, the air flow is determined, so all of that is determined, so you don't have to worry about all those, putting all those things in your state. So how about, let's think about this, how about this? Would it be cool to have an optimization problem for the planning phase 
and then another optimization problem for the execution phase, right? Somehow, and those two optimization problems have to be linked to each other so that it yields a solution to this problem, right? So that would be a cool problem, where what we would do is decouple the slow dynamics optimization with the fast dynamics optimization, but we want to decouple it in such a way that we get either an optimal solution or an approximately optimal solution to this problem. So let's forget about optimality. Let's try to focus purely on the approximate optimal solution for this problem. So here is the way to do it. We want to come up with an approximate, approximate solution, approximately optimal solution. When I say approximately optimal solution, even if you are within like one or two per, no, within like, uh, so let's say the cost of optimal solution is, uh, the, the value is 300 and you are at 305, that's your approximately optimal solution, it's okay. You are, you are maybe like one or two percent off the optimal solution, that's fine, it's, it's okay for the engineering system. You don't care truly about getting to the optimal solution, as long as you're within two, three percent of the optimal solution, you're okay. So let's, uh, let's try to figure out how, I mean, let's try to understand how people have solved this in the past. It's an old theory. This is a theory from 1980s, maybe 1970s to 80s. And then it matured in 1990s. Uh, a lot of theory was developed in 1990s and then uh, people are now using it in day-to-day -day systems. So here is what the assumptions are. There exists a function h from x cross u to y such that f2 of x hxu and u is equal to h of x u and the second is g of x g t of x h x u u is less than equal to zero for all t. We are implicitly going to assume that all the cost function functions, these are all differentiable functions and there is no, uh, there is no non-differentiable behavior in this problem. Okay. So what this H function is trying to do is it looks at the X and U pair and then it comes up with the equilibrium Y. What is the equilibrium Y? What's the equilibrium engine RPM in the fast dynamics, given that the slow dynamics planning is happening at the second scale? So given that this is the velocity of the vehicle and this is the accelerator position or brake position, this is the gear number, what is the equilibrium engine RPM at which the vehicle will just cruise at that constant velocity without any problem? So that's the H is some sort of equilibrium behavior of the, slow, uh, of the fast dynamic system, given that the slow dynamic system is taking, is in some state and is taking certain action. And this is the feasibility constraint. You want the equilibrium to be feasible. If the equilibrium is not feasible, if the equilibrium is not able to maintain the constraint, then there is no point trying to solve the problem. You will never be able to solve the problem. So you want the equilibrium behavior to be feasible. Okay, does that make sense? Any question on this assumption? So the assumption seems quite reasonable. We want to have some sort of equilibrium behavior which maps the slow dynamics variable to equilibrium of the fast dynamics variable. So this is the equilibrium part. 
And this is the feasibility part, that the equilibrium must be feasible. It shouldn't become infeasible. When a car is going to crash, that, that feasibility constraint is not met. Okay? So very close to crash, that feasibility will not be met. But far away from the crash, feasibility will be met and you will be able to come to a stop before the crash happens. So, <clears throat> so that's the sort of day-to-day -day uh, uh, way to think about what these two constraints mean. And what happens when the constraints are not met? When the equilibrium constraints are not met, there is going to be a crash and something bad is going to happen. Okay. So under that assumption, you define two optimization problems. The first is the slow dynamics optimization, where you define your CH of XU to be CT of X h of x u u and then you define g h of t of x comma u to be g t And the slow dynamics optimization is I want to minimize over all policy mu t that maps x t to u t of summation So that's the slow dynamics optimization. That's the optimization for the planning phase. Okay, so I look at the equilibrium behavior of the system and I'm just solving the planning problem for the, with the, under the equilibrium behavior. So I'm going to change xt, sorry, let me write it, where should I write it? Uh, okay, I'm going to erase this part. And I'm going to write here xt plus 1 equals to xt plus epsilon f1 xt h of xt ut ut. Okay, so the state transition is completely in terms of xt and ut. The cost is completely in terms of xt and ut. And the constraint is completely in terms of xt and ut. Because we are assuming that the fast dynamics will always be at the equilibrium. Okay. So I've assumed that the fast dynamics will be at equilibrium for every state action pair, xt, ut. And I come up with a slow dynamics optimization, which is the planning problem in the case of car example. And I've come up with an optimal plan, depending on the current state, what the optimal plan looks like, what sort of action should I be taking. Assuming engine is doing what it is doing, whatever it's supposed to do at the equilibrium. Now in reality, 
what's happening here is that xt is changing slowly with respect to time so it's going to create some sort of transient behavior at the engine level okay so if you're accelerating or if you're braking the rpm has to increase a little bit so from 2500 rpm it has to go to like 2550 rpm or from 2500 rpm it has to go to 2450 rpm right so there is some transient behavior at the slow at the fast dynamic scale and we want to do the optimization of that fast dynamics now okay we want to make sure that while we are going from 2500 rpm to 2450 rpm i am maintaining all the constraints and i am i am uh, close to the optimal behavior as far as the emissions goes so for that what you do is you define this new state zt which is yt minus f2 xt yt gamma sorry mu star t xt remember this is the mu star t this is where mu star comes from oh sorry this is the h of xt mu star t xt so that's the deviation from the equilibrium let me call this deviation from equilibrium due to transient behavior but note that this is not a very large deviation this is a small deviation this is not significant so i'm looking at the deviation or error uh, from the equilibrium behavior and then i'm going to define vt as my action minus gamma star t sorry mu star t of xt <coughs> so this is the deviation from the from the optimal action that comes from the planning phase this is ut minus mu star t xt so going back to the previous class this term is the nominal trajectory that yt should be taking and this is the nominal action that the system should be taking and we are looking at the error and now what should we do what should we do with this error what do we want to do with this error we want to minimize it right we want to minimize this error and that is a tracking problem oh uh, i guess we are over time but actually the fast dynamics optimization is basically i want to minimize zt transpose qzt plus vt transpose rvt summation t equals 1 to capital t and i want to minimize and get uh, uh, gamma is taken mu is taken nu okay so new star t that maps zt to vt and this is new star this is new and then the optimal policy or at least approximately optimal policy let me call this gamma star t well gamma star is optimal let me make it gamma tilde star so it's an approximately optimal policy of xt 
y t u t would be mu star t x t plus mu star t y t minus Okay, that's an approximately optimal policy. New start, uh, yeah, I'm minimizing over all possible strategies, new t, that maps zt to vt. That maps the deviation from the equilibrium to deviation of the nominal action. And then I'm just going to add the two strategies in order to get, sorry, this should, there should not be any ut here. This is ut. This is approximately optimal. Okay. And that's all I wanted to cover in today's class. So next class we are going to talk about statistics and hypothesis testing. Thank you for your attention.